I'm honored to present now the Honorable Thomas J. Dodd, United States Senator. Mr. Murphy, my fellow citizens, I'm greatly pleased and greatly honored indeed to have been invited to participate in this affair tonight. It's a great inspiration to me. I've had the feeling that there's a groundswell underway. I got it first when I was here a few weeks ago, and I felt it in other parts of the country. And I think this groundswell of which we speak is very largely due to the work, the dedication, the zeal, the courage as well, of the men and women who have made it possible for this meeting to take place, the meetings which preceded it, and which will make it possible for Dr. Swartz to fulfill this uh, list of engagements that he spoke about a few minutes ago. When I left my home in Connecticut this morning, by the way, it was 22 above zero at the house. <laughs> at the airport, I picked up a copy of the New York Times, and I read an, I read an account a story about this meeting. Well, I, I'm not critical of that. I don't think you should be either. That's not the point of what I have to say. But it interested me to read that uh, the reporter said there was some criticism of this affair. Certain people in this community and this facility. And he proceeded to list their reasons. But it interested me very much that the first reason that he gave was that both Senator Dodd and Congressman Judd are Republicans. I, um, now I, uh, I like Paul the Judd, he's my friend and he's, he's a wonderful man, but I'm a Democrat. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I hope the rest of that story was more accurate than at that particular point. I might say, having mentioned Congressman Judd, I should say that in my judgment, he's one of the greatest Americans of our generation. He is, uh, I know there's not to be any politics in this, and I wouldn't inject any. But I, as I said this, I was reminded when I was a young man, old enough to vote, when I was 21, my father, who I think was a very wise man, sat me down. He said, now, Thomas, you're old enough to vote. I think you should study the platforms of both parties, and you should study the programs of both candidates. You should think, think about this. It's a very serious matter. And then on election day, you go into that polling place and vote a straight Democratic ticket. <laughs> well, we're very, we're very fair-minded in Connecticut, you know. My fellow citizens, we meet here tonight at, a, at an ominous moment in our nation's history. World communism, like a mammoth cloud, darkens the future of individuals and of nations. One third of the world's people is already enslaved by it, and another third is teetering on the edge of the chasm. And the lives of all who live in the avowedly anti-communist world are altered and complicated because of it. You will pay the price of communism whether you realize it or not. At the very least, at the best, some of your lives may be interrupted by military service or the lives of your husbands and your, or your brothers, your relatives or your friends. You will have to pay the expense of resisting communism in the form of high taxes and continuing inflation. And you must sacrifice the inestimable benefits that could otherwise have resulted from the enormous amount of national energy that must go into resisting communism. And day-to-day -day anxiety and uncertainty and worry over the future will continue to affect the daily lives of each of us. But thinking and compassionate men and women must be deeply and continually saddened by the knowledge that one billion fellow human beings 
are at the mercy of a ruthless, conscienceless barbarism. For communism stands in the way of peace and of progress and of security for all mankind. At the worst or most, it poses for all of us the threat of war, of enslavement, and even of annihilation. That is why it is so important that we have a proper understanding of this fearful specter that stalks the earth. Unfortunately, there is a great deal of confusion, fuzziness and apathy abroad concerning communism, some of it stemming from even academic circles. There are a number of stock arguments which one hears continuously that tend to obscure the real nature of communism and dissipate one of the principal weapons against it. That weapon is the moral condemnation of decent people. We hear repeatedly that nothing is gained by continually raking over the past crimes of the communists, as though it would somehow be better to forget the true nature of the enemy. We read a lot of newspaper accounts of how things have improved behind the Iron Curtain, but very, very little, precious little, about the essential barbarism upon which communism is founded and which sustains it in power. And there is a philosophy current that much of our difficulties with the communists are due to misunderstanding, which implies that the Soviets and Red Chinese are perhaps well-meaning and that our difficulties could be resolved if we would only look at their side of things and get them to look at our side. Perhaps the most popular phrase of those who minimize the evils of communism is that we cannot look at the world seen in terms of black and white. How many times have we heard this said? Things are just not black and white, certainly not with respect to this issue. And this, of course, carries the implication that both the free world and the communist world are at fault for the present danger and that each side has its good points and its bad points. This is an argument that is abroad in the land and in the world. Now, I will concede our bad points, but I have never been able to discover the good points of communism. This. This type of thinking, my friends, seeping into the American consciousness from all sides has produced a cumulative attrition and confusion. People who are weary after long years of anxiety are only too happy to seize upon such news items as the building of a children's playground in Moscow as an indication that the Kremlin masters are human after all and that everything is going to be all right. This sort of thing, constantly repeated, causes us to let down our guard, to look for an easy way out. It is so much more comfortable to believe that the difference between ourselves and the communists, the differences rather, are negotiable. That coexistence is possible. That we can purchase peace through the easy road of periodic concessions at the expense of other peoples. So it seems to me that first of all, here tonight, in this country, let's get one thing straight. Let's get communism in true focus. Communism is total evil. It is all black. It, it is all black, there is nothing gray about it, there is nothing good about it, its ends are evil, its means to those ends are evil. Communism is total evil because it is totally materialistic. 
In rejecting God, the communists have rejected those concepts of morality and of the God-given rights of man, which dignify the individual and which constitute the true basis of any civilization worthy of the name. If by force of circumstance, communists offer something right, it is only as an expedient to advance their evil aims. If they occasionally appear in a worthy light, it is because they must make some appeal to human needs and aspirations. When they educate the ignorant, it is to perfect their apparatus of enslavement. When they industrialize, it is to strengthen their capacity for aggression. When they talk peace, it is another means of waging war. When they permit long overdue improvements in living conditions, it is evidence that even communists Communist oppressors must make some concessions to the wishes of the oppressed. There is no evil so appalling that communists would shrink from it if it would effectively advance their ends. There is no atrocity so hideous that they would not willingly commit it if it served their purposes. The red Chinese regime in the 10 short years of its ugly existence has as a matter of government policy murdered 30 million men, women, and children. The horror contained in this statistic is too great for the human mind to assimilate or indeed for the human soul to ponder. And this is but a repetition of the crimes of the Soviet communists which have been committed on the same scale. Communism is at war with the whole human race. It is based on the blasphemy a human being is just a particle of matter without independent mind or spirit. And it seeks, you know, to destroy the family as an institution. It seeks to wipe out religion. It seeks to blot out the human conscience and distort all concepts of right and wrong. It seeks to reduce man to a mere beast of burden without will, without personality, without personal property, without knowledge of God without hope of eternal life. Thankfully, of course, they have not yet been successful in this task. They have found the objective of permanently defacing human nature somewhat beyond them. The task has been too great. There have been many retreats, deviations, new approaches, but the goal never changes. We must always remember that, and we must constantly renew our understanding of it. At this hour, the Western world is engaged in negotiation with the communists. Unless there is a fundamental change in communist doctrine, and I say this sadly, there is no hope that these negotiations will in any way abate our differences or reduce tensions. I say this for three reasons. First, communism is fundamentally de dedicated to the destruction of the free world and of the ethical and rational basis of that world. Its fixed and unswerving objective is to destroy us. As long as this remains true, there is no hope of lasting settlement or of any relaxation of tensions since such things must be based on some common interest between East and West. Secondly, I say this because whereas we in the West regard peace as the normal order of things and warfare as the interruption of that order, communist doctrine regards warfare, ceaseless conflict and violence as essential, as essential to their idea of life. There is no such thing as peace to them. There is only the absence of conflict. Therefore, it is only the West, really, that seeks peace. And the notion that peace is being prevented by mere misunderstandings or resolvable differences is an absurdity. Third, I say it because there is almost no hope that arguments based on reason and truth will have any effect at all on communists at the bargaining table. For the true communism, you know, there's no criterion of truth. 
And I, I interrupt myself to say here that I can speak with some knowledge. I lived and worked intimately for nearly 18 months with communists, and I know whereof I speak. While we in the West subject our policies and our principles to many tests of truth, which are above, beyond, and independent of our political credo, the communist is incapable of doing so. Argumentation will not move him. Any man who has ever had to deal with him knows that this is so. Truth will not pierce his dialectical armor, and he will give ground only when he is convinced that the free world will not yield and that he has the power to resist his demands and his ultimatums. These facts, these facts, my friends, are, are fundamental to any successful coping with communism. Now, this having been said, I hasten to add, because I think it is essential and extremely necessary that I add, that the mere rejection of communism offers no solution to this worldwide danger. It is not rejection that the world is seeking, but affirmation. The impoverished, despairing peoples of the world are in search of a leader, a philosophy, a helping hand that promises a way out of their present degradation. We Americans have an old familiar saying, you can't beat something with nothing. Well, we can't beat false prophets with no prophets. We cannot beat dedication to evil with lack of dedication to good. We cannot solve the desperate problems afflicting half the world by merely resisting communism or rejecting the communist solution. We must offer a solution of our own. We must put forward our solution, and we must do so in the face of several major disadvantages. The record of colonialism of our European allies stands against us in the eyes of those who do not understand that communism is the most ruthless and total imperialism the world has ever known. The totalitarian communist bloc can act with a unity that we are not capable of. A decisiveness and a single-mindedness that is impossible for the democratic coalition. And in the nature of things, the aggressor has an initiative that the free world cannot seem to wrest from it. But communism has one fatal disadvantage. It runs against the grain of human nature. It, it not only runs against the grain of human nature, it chokes and destroys the spirit of man. Because it is evil, and because men are good, communists cannot satisfy any of the higher needs of man, or the aspirations, the hopes, and the yearnings that distinguish men from other forms of life. Even the most primitive man values his primitive freedoms, the right to manage his life as he sees fit, the right to a family life of his own, the right to till his land and enjoy its produce. But there is no right so natural or so primitive that communism does not deny it. That is why communism is hated so passionately by all its victims from the illiterate Chinese peasant to the sophisticated East European intellectual. Until recent years, the communists, although they amplified their efforts through front organizations, always bid for power in their own name. Communist movements used to identify themselves as such. But within the past several years, they've begun to bid for power through crypto-communist movements. The Castro movement in Cuba is a chief example. These movements do not appeal to the people in the name of communism. On the contrary, they do their best to foster the impression that they are not communists. But of course, once they come to power, all the promises are forgotten and they, they proceed to establish their communist dictatorships along the pattern pioneered by Moscow. 
The point is, we must accept the fact, as the communists have, that the immediate battleground in the world today is not the higher needs of man. It is the lower needs, the more tangible, the immediate day-to-day -day necessities of existence. Freedom and all the values that this term suggests cannot flourish or have meaning without the existence of certain fundamental material conditions. We in America have become used to a constantly rising standard of living. We've come to expect it as though it were in the nature of things. But for a large part of the world, my friends, living standards have actually been declining despite the enormous technical advances of the past century. Now this, in my judgment, leads inevitably to the feeling of hopelessness upon which the communists and the crypto-communists thrive. The West, we of the West, despite our vast super, vastly superior wealth and our primacy in the realm of the spirit, seem unable to cope with the simplified bread and butter social reform ideology of the crypto-communists in countries like Cuba, in British Guiana, in the Congo. We just haven't been able to do this. Nor is the example of our high standard of living or of our flourishing political institutions causing the unfortunate people of the world to flock to our colors. Our talk of democracy, of free institutions, of representative government seems too parochial, too involved, too concerned with forms to go to the heart of man's basic needs. We seem unable to make our ideological system in intelligible to others. And we seem unable, too, to make the billions of dollars we spend annually in foreign aid count for as much as it should. At a time of critical importance, at a time of critical importance to Western civilization, we seem unable to produce enough leaders who can so articulate the needs and hopes of men as to inspire the love and the admiration and the trust that America once enjoyed. In our history, in our philosophy, in our religion, in the practical programs of assistance already in effect, we have all the needed elements for a new order of justice and peace and plenty. An order that will satisfy the lowest and the highest needs of men. We lack only enough spokesmen, enough statesmen, enough leaders who can combine these elements in a form that will rekindle the hope and the enthusiasm of the world. We had it once, we can have it again. If, if the Western world, if we in the Western world with our unparalleled capacity for producing material wealth, if we can meet these immediate fundamental material needs of men, if we can lead the way to the eradication of social injustices, of poverty, of discrimination, of material degradation, then the battleground for the hearts and the minds of the world's people will change to a conflict in which we of the West will have all the advantage. For man's higher needs are the very things that we of the West can provide we can give answer for, and which the cold, merciless dogma of communism cannot supply. The highest value that Karl Marx could put upon a man was that he was the most precious form of capital. If that were true, if that were true, if that were the full significance of man, then communism would indeed inherit the earth. But thank God it is not true. Man possesses mental and spiritual attributes above and beyond the material world. He has needs and appetites that no material order or philosophy can satisfy. 
He needs friendship. He needs understanding. He needs truth. He needs love. Our Judaic Christian civilization, nourished by contributions from the Greco-Roman world, has in its finest aspects the highest response to these higher needs of mankind. We have preserved the tradition, the revelation, and the moral law of God. It is we and not the communists who are able to satisfy man's higher needs. And this and this alone will save us. A terrible example. Some time back, thinking about all of this, it occurred to me that the terrible example of communism is having one salutary effect on the Western world. I believe it is helping us to purge ourselves of many of our own weaknesses. The example of their total materialism is making us rightly ashamed of our own materialism. The example of their total atheism is making us ashamed and is calling forth a spiritual rejuvenation in the West. Their attempt to destroy all moral values is causing us to re-examine our own neglect of those values. Their record of ruthless imperialism has caused the West to be ashamed of its own imperialism so that as communist imperialism has grown, Western imperialism has waned. Their brutality is enlarging our compassion. In the sins of communism, we see our own sins writ large. In our desperate need to overcome evil, we are rediscovering our own capacity for good. But the example of communist evil perhaps has, as I think it has, fortified us to the extent of which I have just spoken mor in morals. Unfortunately, we have yet to show the political wisdom necessary to triumph over communism. Thus far, we have refused to face up to the basic fact that we are involved in a life where death struggled with an enemy, utterly ruthless, amoral, and merciless. If the free world limits itself to defending itself when it is attacked, as it has up until now, then the free world may defeat, may suffer defeat in our own lifetime. But the moment we rededicate ourselves to those basic principles which gave birth to our country, the moment we set our sights on the worldwide victory of freedom as the only alternative to worldwide tyranny, then I am convinced horizons which now seem black would become bright overnight. The perils ahead of us are great. But our historic opportunities are equally great. President Kennedy on Inauguration Day said in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I quote him, he said, I do not shrink from this responsibility, I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it, and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. This was a wonderful statement, and to this appeal for dedication and courage, all of us, all Americans, all free men, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, we must all equally respond. In the mortal struggle that confronts us, we shall require the greatest possible degree of national unity. And I know from personal experience that that kind of unity is possible. So let us not exaggerate our differences. Let us rather place emphasis on those fundamental traditions and beliefs that unite us as Americans. And if we so unite, 
if we so commit ourselves, then with God's grace, the 20th century will go down in history as the century of the universal triumph of freedom. And this meeting tonight gives me reason to believe that indeed all is not dark. And while, as I said, the perils are great that lie before us, I firmly and devoutly believe, and I am sure that I speak for all of you here and many beyond this gathering, we all believe, we must believe, we do believe that this is a fight we can win and we will win. Thank you all for your attention. I enjoy being here. I'm honored to present now Cleon Skousen, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, my good friend George, Senator Dodd, Congressman Judd, Dr. Schwartz, distinguished guests, and my fellow Americans. What a thrilling thing this is tonight to be complimented with your presence and to have the privilege of spending these few moments discussing this important theme. For we all come here tonight with one heart and one mind to solve an international problem and a personal problem which has descended upon this generation with an impact that has been devastating up to this time. And we've watched millions of our friends gradually go down under the impact of this problem and tonight we stand resolved to do something about it. I have noticed that when people first start studying communism, they go through three stages. First, a state of shock, when they discover what we have been allowing to happen in the world to ourselves and our allies. And then they go into a state of quiet contemplation, meditation, and profound study. And they come up on the other side in the third phase, which is I've got to do something about this. And you are in that third stage tonight. Your presence here demonstrates it. And my assignment in these few moments that I occupy is to suggest to you some of the things that we could be doing that we haven't been doing, which would start to roll back this mammoth red tide of evil that has been sweeping over the world. My thesis tonight is we do not have to take communism lying down anymore. There is something we can do about it. <laughs> Just what each individual will do depends, of course, upon who he is and where he is. In the 12th chapter of The Naked Communist, I devoted about one half of that chapter to suggestions on what individuals could do depending on whether they were students, teachers, parents, businessmen, ministers, members of the legislature, members of the press, and so forth. And then there's something that as we collectively gather together our strength in the aggregate that we can do nationally and internationally. And that's the thing, the theme to which I now wish to devote my time. I have watched the fine sponsors of this program tonight, the ones that have put it in the power of Dr. Schwartz and his fine associates with whom we have served to get this message out and across. <laughs> this is the kind of spirit that is behind these men who say there's something they can do. And up and down, I notice in our various communities, we're saying we can do something. And uh, the Thursday night, we're meeting over here in Downey, where the superintendent of schools and that whole school district has decided that 
They want to teach their children in the classroom, the adults in night classes, and then in their big football stadium Thursday night, they're having a big rally for the public. Now, I'm particularly honored tonight to follow Senator uh, Dodd's remarks in picking up the theme of this evening because I have a, a special appreciation for him. He did something for all of us in September as a spokesman in the Senate that is just beginning to bear fruit as of the last two days. You know, the thing that happened in the Congo is a mystery to our people. Senator Dodd was following it. While everybody else was piling up in Berlin and trying to figure out how to solve that crisis that had been created specifically to divert our attention, Senator Dodd was following Laos and the Congo. And he knew that that's where the touchdown was going to occur because we're playing a team, a vicious team, that will do the things sometimes that would occur in football where we get the linemen all stacking up and knocking one another down and getting into a big heap and the boys get up and get their wind back and say, well, we really stopped them. And then you hear the crowd cheer for some touchdown. And you say, what happened? Well, we forgot to watch the ball carrier. That's what happened. And that's exactly what occurred at Berlin. While we were all stacked up at Berlin, Senator Dodd watched the ball carrier and saw the Congo and Laos move over toward the communist camp almost completely. Now, our people couldn't understand what happened. Very simply, it was this. For one solid year, we have been backing a policy that the United Nations was carrying out under the direction of a group of world planners whom I, I am sure were sincere and thought they knew what they were doing, but they were backing a communist coalition in the Congo. And they finally got their communist coalition in the Congo. And the next thing that we knew, while our attention was diverted in Berlin, Gazenga, a hardcore communist, became the number one man in the Congo. And then in September, you'll remember, Shambe, who was the premier of Katanga, the richest province of the Congo, was knocked out by UN military forces, mercenaries paid for mostly by American money. And Shambe, a freedom fighter, a pro-American anti-communist, was replaced by Gazenga's right-hand man, and the Congo fell into the hands of the communists under that kind of a program. It was Senator Dodd who rose in the Senate, protested in four magnificent speeches, which uh, deserves to be studied by our people, and said we are betraying Shambay and the freedom fighters in the Congo that are left. It's now time to move back in the other direction. In order to have these people who are coming up from primitive circumstances survive and remain free, you need two ingredients. First and foremost, a will on their part to survive and be free. They must be willing to fight for their freedom. And secondly, we need the ingredient of support from people who are already free. Now, in this case, Shambé defied the United Nations troops which were forcing communism on the last remaining segment of freedom in the Congo, and he raised a signal of liberty or death, and that's the way he gave it to the people. And the people sustained him in it, and then Senator Dodd began to demand that the United States withhold its support for what was obviously a betrayal in the Congo, and yesterday you notice that Shambe has succeeded now in making some progress and coming back. Now, how did we ever get into a predicament where we were supporting a program, more or less blindly, that was sending the Congo right into the arms of communism? Well, it was the result, it was directly the result of the kind of planning and thinking that has been coming out of a professional group whose sincerity I don't doubt for the moment, but whose record is amazing. They're a group that became entrenched in one of the departments of our government. They controlled the policy that resulted in the loss of China. They were responsible for the policy that lost North Korea after General MacArthur had won it. 
They were responsible for a policy. They were responsible for a policy that has resulted in a communist coalition program in Laos and a and a takeover, a total takeover of communism in Cuba, and they've been responsible for what's been going on in the Congo. Undoubtedly, they think that they undoubtedly they think that they are going to achieve some kind of victory eventually, but we have suffered under these, this kind of policy making, regardless of who was in the White House, regardless of which administration, these people have consistently led to defeat of freedom and American policy. And therefore tonight, my first suggestion to you is that we start out in this program of firming up against communism by cleaning our own house. I therefore recommend... I therefore recommend... I therefore recommend that we develop a firm bipartisan policy demanding a full-scale congressional investigation of the United States State Department. Secondly, Secondly, may I recommend to you for your consideration that we give consideration to the another problem that we have saddled ourselves with that our people don't really understand. And if you will bear with me for a moment, let me just give you a little of the history of this problem. When we came out of World War II, the American people wanted some international arena where peace-loving peoples could sit down together and solve their mutual problems. And so, in a sort of spirit of a blind hopefulness, we apparently accepted the United Nations Charter without carefully examining its contents. As a result, we have gone through now quite a period of time in which we have learned more about what this agency stands for. And as I have spoken to universities, to conventions and groups across the nation, I have found that generally speaking, our people have not read the charter. So let me tell you briefly what it provides. It provided for a general assembly in which all of the nations were represented but where it did not have one iota of legislative authority to deal with problems of war. All of this legislative authority was preempted to a power block called the Security Council, where the five permanent members were given almost dictatorial control to enforce peace on the rest of the world, whether they liked it or not. Americans would appreciate that this basically violated some fundamental constitutional principles. But we went ahead with the program. Now, in order to appreciate the seriousness of this, I take the example given by John Foster Dulles, who originally went along with this program, but recognized its fallacies and pointed it out to the American Bar Association in one of his speeches. And to paraphrase the point he was making, what we had done was to set up an international fire commission to put out international war, put out the fire of war, and then we had put the world's number one fire bug on the fire commission. <laughs> there, is not, there is not one stick of machinery in the United Nations Charter to prevent one of the Big Five from starting World War III. And it's in the Big Five that we have this great predatory, ferocious power that now insists that it will devour the earth by, every, by any means necessary. To appreciate how the United Nations has not worked, let me give you one classical example. One year ago, an RB-47 plane was flying over the Barents Sea. Communist planes from the Soviet Union shot it down, killed four American boys, 
destroyed the plane. The two survivors were kidnapped, taken back behind the Iron Curtain. The United States protested and said this is an act of war. No, Russia said that, that plane had violated our borders and we shot it down in self-defense. The United States said that's an absolute falsehood. We had that plane under continuous radar surveillance from Britain and it was never closer than 30 miles to the Iron Curtain and we can prove it. And so the United States turned to the UN and said we ask for a fair impartial investigation to fix responsibility for this warlike act. And everyone thought that would be a good idea. And so it went to the Security Council and they began to vote. Yes, let's have an investigation. Yes, let's have an investigation. Yes, yes. And then it came to the Soviet Union, which said, there will be no investigation. We veto. Every member of the law, the law profession in this audience, and I'm sure the rest of you besides, will recognize what a legal monstrosity we had saddled ourselves with. Here was the United States, the victim nation, the nation whose citizens had been killed, whose plane had been destroyed, and whose survivors had been kidnapped and captured, asking this international conciliatory body to conduct a fair investigation to fix responsibility for a warlike act, and under the UN Charter, the criminal nation, the one being accused of these crimes, has the legal authority to prevent any investigation being conducted. And this is the organization to which we have delegated authority and a very serious amount of American sovereignty to handle problems dealing with our own integrity and the protection and rights of our citizens. Therefore, my second suggestion to you tonight is that inasmuch as 1956 marked the beginning of the period when we could begin to do something about this problem, we now work through our congressmen, our senators, and our presidents and absolutely insist that the United Nations Charter be rewritten and that organization recaptured or we get out of it. my third suggestion to you is just simply looking at communism for what it actually is. And you've had it properly and accurately described to you tonight. Already we have taken steps partially in this direction. Our Congress has declared any attempt to overthrow our government by violence to be criminal long ago. But it was only recently, as you remember, by a very close decision that the Supreme Court saw fit to say that it indeed was a crime to try and overthrow the government by violence. So that was the first step. And that was quite an achievement. That means that if a person in the United States joins the Communist Party knowingly working for its overthrow by force and violence, he has committed a crime. Then here this last week, the Supreme Court sustained another law which said, and furthermore, the Communist Party has nothing to do with America at all. It's an alien foreign agency and must register as such. Yeah. Now, notice how far we have gone. First, it's a crime to belong to the organization. Secondly, the organization is identified as an, as an alien foreign activity obviously engaged in criminal work inside the United States. I suggest now then as my third point that we go forward with resolution recognizing communism as an international criminal conspiracy and have it completely, totally, legally outlawed. Recently, when we were in the state of Arizona, some of the members of the state legislature listened to one of the schools that Dr. Schwartz and his associates were putting on, and afterwards they said, there is something we can do about communism, and so they wrote a bill. It was introduced by the Democrats that were the prominent, um, uh, that is, the predominant party in Arizona. It was sustained by the Republicans. Some of us were called out of bed about one o'clock in the morning to be interviewed by a number of senators. It then passed 
the Senate without a dissenting vote, and um, not long after that, my good friend Greg Hathaway called me long distance in Salt Lake City and said, Cleon, the governor signed the bill. The Communist Party has been outlawed in the state of Arizona. Now I understand uh, Assembly Bill 1263 will outlaw it in the state of California. A similar bill is being introduced in Nebraska, in Louisiana, in Texas, and a number of other places, so this has begun to roll. And now, not only should the Communist Party be outlawed uh, domestically and inside the United States, but we need to treat it as an evil criminal conspiracy internationally. You see, once you, once you look upon communism as a, as a criminal activity, there are some things that you can immediately and legitimately do about it to curb it and roll it back. And so internationally, we now should take a long look at what has been happening. Since 1933, our government tried to establish some kind of a framework in which communist-dominated countries could demonstrate that they were willing to become a part, a respectable and responsible part of the world community of nations. Since this time, we have found that it is absolutely impossible to achieve any good even though this recognition was granted. In fact, going across the country, I have asked on a number of occasions if any of the professors of political science or history could think of one good thing that had been achieved as a result of recognizing the Soviet Union. They have not been able to suggest one, and I haven't been able to find one. And therefore, I'm recommending to you as the fourth point that we reach a state of mind of firmness and realism where we say to these people, we did everything we could to help you find yourselves and lift your people. Instead of that, you have taken recognition and used it as the key to conquest, moving from 200 million victims up to nearly 1 billion. As far as we who gave you $13 billion worth of help to save you from Hitler are concerned, we've received nothing in return for our generosity but the violation of treaties, the shooting down of our planes, the illegal imprisonment of our citizens. You use your embassies and legations to set up espionage networks within our own territory. And so we say, we've had enough, and now Russia, take your spies and go home. This means severing diplomatic relations, and in order for it to be effective, it would be highly desirable for us to say to all of our allies, we've gone far enough now, there is no excuse for us to blunder further. We invite you all to join us now in this united effort, not to appease, not to accommodate, not to capitulate, but to smother and wipe out this great menace to the whole human race that has found itself like a cancer in the body politic. My last suggestion to you tonight has to do with strategy designed to respond to the cry of the freedom fighters from behind the Iron Curtain. For a number of years, those of us who get an occasional communication from them have heard this plea. There must be a noose of ignorance around the necks of the West. Don't they know that we ourselves would, over, would overthrow our slave masters if the West would just stop feeding, fondling, and coddling them? Some people have not realized how, how genuine and how realistic this actually is. Because behind the Iron Curtain, they have had a continuous depression and a state of restlessness bordering on uprising for a long time. 
The thing that has held it back, actually, has been the, f the inability of the freedom fighters to convince the people behind the Iron Curtain that there would be any firmness in the West, because we seem to have softened and broken our line of firmness every time the chips were really down. And so this summer, a report went to the president from some of his most intimate confidants, advising him that what some more conservative spirits had been saying for a long time was really true, that there is definitely a possibility of having the Iron Curtain fold in and collapse on the heads of the communist dictators. How would this be achieved? By hitting the Soviet empire where she is the weakest. And where is that? This report said it's economics. Now, in spite of all the communist propaganda to the contrary, the, all of the reports from authoritative uh, sources indicate, as does this report to the president, that the people behind the Iron Curtain are completely disillusioned with all of these long-term promises of the communists and now are in a position with a little encouragement from the outside to take action. And here is a direct quote from the report. It says, it should certainly be possible by closer coordination with our allies to prevent the shipment of food to these countries because the entire Soviet empire is suffering serious food shortages. This sort of cooperative planning is urgently needed. As it is now, we refuse to sell food to Red China, but our allies, Canada, West Germany, France, England, are selling millions of tons of grain and other food products to communist China on credit. And this report says that simply doesn't make sense, which is the understatement of the year. <laughs> a united policy would permit a complete clampdown or at least a controlled flow of foodstuff as the situation requires. And then the report says it is entirely possible then to demonstrate to the people behind the Iron Curtain that they're going to have to live with communism and that's all that would be necessary to begin this great surge of determination to overthrow their slave masters. Listen to the report. Russia cannot depend upon her satellite armies. While East Germany has an army of 100,000, its reliability is very doubtful. Surely as doubtful is the reliability of the Polish troops under Russian command. Um, Bulgaria is restive. Albania is showing every sign of resisting uh, Soviet Khrushchev domination and the instability of East Germany is notorious and then it goes on to say that if we would stand firm and if we would take the necessary action to prove to the people by, behind the Iron Curtain that we were definitely through with placating appeasing and accommodating they would then begin to get their forces prepared and so this was my final suggestion to you tonight one of many more that we could make to you that we now say to our allies, as this report to the president suggests, and as many voices have been saying for a long time, let's get united and firmly resolve that we'll say to the communists, we have found that we have been feeding you and keeping you alive when your own people would overthrow you. We're going to give them that encouragement. We now declare a 100% trade embargo against the Sino-Soviet bloc. Had the time permitted, I would have mentioned several other things that come to mind as possible suggestions to you, but these will simply demonstrate that there are things that we can now do. Now you'll notice that these are massive peaceful pressures. These do not involve the United States in any massive warfare. These are the kind of things that we could have used all along had we just mapped out a strategy and said this evil thing is to be stopped and we can stop it. And so tonight, may I close in this spirit of, of hope, because I am not here in a spirit of despair. As I have studied this subject over the years, and as I was preparing the material for the book, The Naked Communist, the lesson that kept, kept pounding through my mind was this. It is possible, it is even probable, it is our duty and absolute necessity 
to get the story through to our people that the West can win. And now this generation, after all of the errors and blunders we have made in the past in trying to deal with communism and so often failing, how wonderful it would be if we would now rise like the men and women who should be the proper descendants of the Founding Fathers and say we will do what is necessary. And if we do it, it's entirely possible for us to celebrate the close of this 20th century with this magnificent achievement. Freedom, freedom in our time, not only for ourselves and our children, but for the captive nations as well. This is entirely possible, and I pray God he'll give us the courage to achieve it. Thank you. I'm honored to present now the member of Congress, Walter Judd. Thank you, George Murphy, and distinguished guests and fellow Americans, all of us who are concerned about our country, because we know we're meeting at a time when these great forces are coming to a collision. No war goes on forever, whether it's a hot war or a cold war. And obviously, Mr. Khrushchev thinks that this war is being moved, as he directs it, to a climax. Uh, Japan looked almost as good at the beginning of 1945 as she had at the beginning of 1942, right after Pearl Harbor. But Japan wasn't as good. An awful lot had been happening. The air strikes on Japan, the submarine blockade had reduced Japan, or were reducing Japan, to a shell. The United States had recovered from Pearl Harbor, rebuilt its fleet, was marching back across the Pacific, building strength every day. So in most wars, after a long time of not much seeming to happen, you begin to realize that one's been gaining and the other has been losing, and that is the moment of peril. Because unless that trend for the losing country can be reversed quickly, then it doesn't go on just at a gradual decline. There comes a point when enemy and allies alone, uh, both realize the losses and it goes down just like this. A rout begins. I'm convinced Mr. Khrushchev thinks that today his military power is so great or he wants us to think his military power is so great and his apparatus now around the world is so widespread and so well disciplined that he can start riots or strikes or disorder in any major city of the world and he believes his propaganda now has been so highly developed that much of the world is confused and divided and he's pushing like a boxer who has his opponent a little groggy he's pushing for a knockout one two three four five and it could happen. I don't like to say that. I don't like to tell people if they ignore their tuberculosis or some other disease, there comes a point when they will die. But this is the history of diseases. Here we are meeting tonight. And you've had a wonderful series of addresses. I suppose when some of you see me come on, you, you feel a little bit like the lady that went to a doctor with an obscure eruption on her skin and the doctor said, uh, have you ever had this before? And she said, yes. And he said, well, you've got it again. Uh. So it may seem like going over the same old thing, same old thing to talk about this communist menace. But the communists talk about it day in and day out. I, I was under the Chinese communist for eight months in 1930. There's nothing new in the picture. Uh, I've been a poor salesman all these years 
for this simple idea that Dr. Swartz has written out so brilliantly and convincingly in his book, that communists act like communists. They don't act like Americans. They don't act like humanitarians. They don't act like Democrats. They don't act like nationalists. They don't act like Jew Judeo pe persons who've been brought up in the Judeo-Christian faith. They act like communists. And this is not a nasty statement. A friend of mine in Minneapolis said to me, he said, Water, you're just playing the same old scratchy records over that I've heard all these 30 years since you came back from China. And I said to him, Bob, how much is two times two? He said, four. I said, there you go, playing that same old scratchy record that I've heard all these years. Why don't you change the record? I wish I didn't have to say these things. Tom Dodd, my dear friend, and incidentally, we'll welcome him into the Republican Party because he's the cream of the crop. <laughs> he doesn't like to say these things. Nobody has, likes to face up to this kind of situation, but here it is. And I'd like to make at the beginning about five basic statements that I think we ought to keep at the back of our minds as we try to interpret these, these various explosions that take place around the world. East, west, north, south, if you look at them, almost all of them are merely the latest manifestation in new places of the same fundamental virus or infection that infects the whole body. Our foreign policies are, and relations are extraordinarily difficult, but they are not particularly complicated. There's a consistent pattern, a head and tail, a cause and effect, all through the happenings uh, around the world in these last very 16 years. Uh, our first impression of the world is the things that are different, the things that are changing. You say, well, I haven't seen the last newspaper, I haven't heard the, Lord, the last broadcast, so I don't know where we are. Well, I'm not so disturbed about the last one. I am concerned about these fundamental pigeonholes or principles around which you can sort the individual um, eruptions and explosions as they take place. The first hard fact is that the communist conspiracy remains the same. We've hoped, we've prayed, we've nudged, we've negotiated, we've conceded, we've bribed, we've cajoled, trying to get some kind of a change so that we could relax and live in a civilized way with all peoples. We don't want trouble, but the hard fact is there is no change. The communists have reaffirmed that themselves in the most unequivocal terms, and they've already released them communique that's going to be adopted in the next two weeks and the meeting that begins tomorrow in Moscow and there won't be any amendments adopted either by their legislative body and there won't be any votes against it. You know what it's going to say. It says the climax or the crisis is approaching. Victory is almost within their grasp. Now they declare that their main obstacle to world peace is the United States, which is their way of saying that their number one target, it's not Mr. Shambi of the Congo, it isn't Chiang Kai-shek, it isn't Adenauer or Willy Brandt in Germany. Their number one target is the United States because we're all that stand between them tonight and total control of this planet. No conqueror was ever so near. Total mastery. Only the alertness, the astuteness, the strength, the steadfastness, the character of the United States stands between them and our own enslavement and that of all mankind in our time. Now, worse than the fact that there's been no change is this fact that the communists cannot change. They can't abandon their program of world com conquest. They have as a man, uh, a, a, a man in Afghanistan told me two years ago, our people were wondering if those folks up on the communist border understood communism. He wondered why we didn't seem to understand it. He said they have a world doctrine. It requires world control. Now this is not a charge by me. They'll explain this to you gladly. They'll say that they've got to conquer the world because as Mr. Khrushchev said here two years ago, they want peace. Peace and friendship, 
peace and friendship. And people say they're hypocrites. Oh, no, they aren't hypocrites necessarily when they say that. You ladies out there, when your husbands or brothers or sons were away at war in World War II or the Korean War, you wanted peace. You prayed for peace. You yearned for peace. You weren't hypocrites. But you didn't want your men folks to surrender. You wanted the Japanese and German militarists to see the folly of their, act their actions and give up so the fighting could stop and your men folks could come home. So the communists will tell you with a light in their eye that they want peace and the only way they can ever have peace is when the institution of private property is abolished because they say Karl Marx discovered a law. Just as Newton, when the apple hit him on the head, is supposed in a flash of insight to have perceived the law of gravity. He did not invent the law of gravity if it had been there quite a while. But he perceived it. And there it was. You might not like Newton, but just well accept it. It was a law. So they say Karl Marx noticed that there always in history are wars between those who own property and those the, uh, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, those who work for wages. And so in order to get peace, you've got to destroy the institution of private property. And in order to destroy that, you have to conquer the world because people who have private property won't give it up voluntarily. And why won't we give it up? Just because we're greedy? If it would bring peace, we would do it. We don't give it up because we have some insights. One of them was quoted here tonight. Our forefathers wrote it down. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We aren't going to argue them. We perceive them. This is the way the universe is built, that all men are created. And they're endowed, not by their government, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Man was born for these. He can't live without them any more than a fish who was created to live in water can long live without the water. There's a grain on this table here and down the side. Uh, it isn't painted on there. It grew that way out in the forest. And so, as Tom Dodd said, there's a grain in man. He was created this way. And he can't protect his life or his liberty unless he's able to keep that extension of his own life and liberty which he's earned in order to improve the lot and the education of his family and his community and so on. It's not greed. It's necessary as one of the essential rights. Sometimes you hear people talk about human rights and property rights. That sounds as if they were, one was very superior and the other was sort of sordid and materialistic. It sounds impressive, but it is not profound. You cannot possibly defend your human rights unless you're able to have property that by which you can feed your family while you're resisting the tyrants. This is why the communists talk about dictatorship of the proletariat. It's easy to control the proletariat. If you don't have a little piece of land, a garden, a chicken, a pig, anything stashed away, how do you feed your family while you resist the power of the tyrant. These are all put together, and our forefathers thought about it more clearly than we tend to, and uh, as clearly as the communists do when they wrote in the, pream in the amendments to our Constitution uh, that no citizen can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. These are all essential for men to stand on their own feet and be true to the grain that's in them. The communists know that better than we do. They've studied us, and they have to conquer the world, destroy private property, take children away from their parents so the parents can't pass on to them these old-fashioned errors about the dignity and the decency of man created in the image of God. And then they can bring these youth up as Pavlov brought up dogs to react, not the way, so they say, man thinks he was destined to react, but to react the way those who control the environment determine. And then youth won't think of themselves, and they won't think the individual has any special dignity or right or importance as a human being. And then they will be cooperative, and nobody will try to get anything from anybody else, 
and then you won't need policemen, and then the state can wither away, and then you have the perfect society with peace and friendship. Isn't that clear? I've heard this, I've heard this explained to me so many times that I tell you frankly, in the brainwashing period, I wondered whether our people were sufficiently alert to this in our generation to preserve it. The communists can't abandon that until they renounce themselves. Who renounces himself, especially when he thinks he's winning? Let's not daydream about some change taking place there. Miracles always can take place. Pray for them. Once in a while, a cancer all by itself for no, for no explainable reason begins to regress. But any person who has a cancer better assume that his is one of those most of the millions that won't regress. regress. He's got to deal with it. What makes us think that communism is changing almost from hour to hour? It's because their tactics are, they are taught in their tactics to be completely fluid. When they're winning, like any good boxer, they pour it on. When they were winning at Dien Ben Phu, the French asked for a truce to evacuate their wounded. The communists wouldn't give them a truce, of course not. Because they're not humanitarians. The objective was to keep the French in trouble when they were in trouble. When we had the communists in trouble, deep trouble, in Korea, they asked for a truce, and of course we gave it to them. Uh, then they said, let's talk. People say, you never lose anything by talking. Well, it was during those two years of talk, talk, talk at Panmunjom that they got the H-bomb. And it was during two years of talk, talk, talk at Geneva about disarmament that they got Sputnik, and then they adjourned the disarmament conferences, and there haven't been any serious ones since. There never have been any serious ones from their point of view. They were buying time and causing us to relax, thinking something was happening while they were driving ahead. It's hard for us to believe this. We're sort of victims or prisoners of our own decencies. I don't want us to, to abandon these decencies. If we were to become like them, they would have won. But I would suggest as our motto at this, the teachings of him who said, if you would be wise as, if you would be harmless as doves, and that's what we all want, of course, you must be wise as serpents. Now, he didn't say you must be serpents. Then they have won. But you and I must be wise as serpents, so we don't follow, fall into these traps. Now, Dr. Swartz says they're going to Washington to have one of these, and I assure you it's needed. Let me read. Uh, because, because if this is old scratchy record here, they haven't read it yet in the State Department. I, uh, This is a booklet got out about a month ago by the State Department and passed out Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, Gateway to Peace, just after they had uh, broken up the, uh, the Russians had sort of disintegrated, uh, or at least dis quit the pretense of serious negotiations. Let me read a little of it. Nothing has frustrated men of goodwill more than the failure of the great nations to agree on how they might safely disarm. I resent a statement like that. It equates the United States as if we were all to blame. There's only one great nation that's responsible for our inability to disarm. <laughs> now listen. Now listen to the causes why we haven't been able to get agreement. Many things have contributed to, to that failure. The historic legacy of suspicions among nation states, the inherent tension between closed and open societies, the technical difficulties of devising mechanisms of inspection and control, the political difficulties of accepting mechanisms of enforcement, even perhaps the vested interests which some dogmas and institutions may have in the perpetuation of crisis. It mentions all the reasons except the only reason that the Soviet Union exists to conquer the world and doesn't want a test ban agreement. It only wants to make us think something happening while it talks. Now, what can you do? 
when our own government hasn't discovered that the communist com conspiracy is a communist conspiracy dedicated to our destruction. Can't they read or won't they read? It says, it, it says the overhanging sense of gravity produced for a time in 1958 to 60 season of genuine negotiation. Now the reason for that was this, they had put an ultimatum of six months on Berlin testing us. They were counting on you and me who'd been fed the line that we just can't have an atomic war to insist that our government give in little by little rather than have an atomic explosion. And President Eisenhower one day at a press conference was asked by the newsmen, well, what if the communists move militarily after the expiration of this uh, ultimatum on May 26th and President Eisenhower prevented a war with seven words. He said it would not be a ground war. Whereupon the communists backed away, rattled their rockets and growled, and, and immediately said, let's have some more conversations. Let's have some more conversations. So it says, there was a season of genuine negotiation. There was give and take. Areas of disagreement narrowed. The test ban treaty was the world's first hope of progress. It is this hope which the Soviet Union, through an abrupt and inexplicable reversal of its own position, now threatens to dash from our lips. Now I despair. These are the men in charge of our country, and they can understand that the Soviet Union, when it's weak or in difficulty, pretends to negotiate to buy time, and then when it's strong, and it's ready to do some more testing, uh, inexplicably reverses its own position. Now, when I see a quarterback fake a handoff to the right and then run to the left, I don't say, well, I'm so disappointed in that nice, clean-looking young kid. I never thought he would trick that other team. His conduct is inexplicable. No, any other conduct would have been inexplicable. You don't say that about him because you know he's playing football and you understand football. You know the objective in football is not improve relations with the other team. <laughs> you know, you know the objective is touchdown. Now I watched the World Series the other day. And that Whitey Ford, he blazed through his fastball. And then how insincere he was. He didn't throw the fastball every time. He threw his slider and his sinker and his curve and his slow ball change of place. Now how can you justify a man deceiving the batter that way? <laughs> now, this is the State Department in charge of your destiny. No wonder we got to have a school just plain go to school and read and listen to the old scratchy records. Communism is communism. It is not agrarian reform. It is not Jeffersonian democracy. It is not Christianity. These are not nasty charges. This is just a, an intelligent recognition that a tiger acts like a tiger. And if you call him a pussycat and pat him on the head, it doesn't make him a pussycat. He still is a tiger. <laughs> Communism remains the same. My, I wish I didn't have to say that, but it does. The second thing that remains the same is that since there is this conspiracy and since there, since there isn't any way for us to get off the planet as yet, we have to resist it because we don't care to be enslaved. This is the Cold War. Some people talk as if the Cold War was something thought up by Dean Acheson or Mr. Dulles. No. The Cold War is not the policy of choice. No congressman likes the Cold War. It's a policy of necessity. It's the price of our survival. What are the alternatives? Hot war. You like that? Surrender. You want that? Well, if you don't want surrender or hot war, then your only hope is in a Cold War. That leads to number three. You can't call this Cold War off except on their terms, and their terms are surrender. 
This is not, again, an unsupported charge by me. It's been tried. President Roosevelt tried it. He went to two conferences at the summit. When he came home from the last one, he said, I didn't like the concessions I made with respect to Poland, but I thought it was necessary, in effect, to reassure the communists. He assumed that because this government was in Moscow, it was the Russian government interested in the well-being of the Russian people. A communist government is a world revolutionist. It is not working as normal, healthy governments operate in terms of national interest. And he knew before he died, President Roosevelt, that the communists weren't interested in just security on their west and on their south and a warm water port in the east and so on, which had been given them. They were interested in conquest. And then Mr. Truman tried to call it off, President Truman, at a conference at the summit. He accepted what had been developed by this same clique about whom Mr. Skousen spoke in the State Department. He, he developed, he accepted the line that since the communists of Russia had been invaded twice by militaristic Germany, it was understandable that they would want it to be divided, so we would divide Germany and uh, Berlin, and that would reassure the communists and then they'd be satisfied just to work for the Russians. No, it moved them over from first base to second base. And uh, then President Eisenhower tried to call it off. He didn't want to go to a conference, but public opinion in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee leader said, you've got to go and try to get a settlement. Now you must always be willing to talk when there's some evidence of some gains. Jesus had a conference at the summit with the devil when the devil requested it. I can't find that Jesus pursued him, particularly looking for the conference, but when the devil requested it, Jesus had a conference. But when he found out that the devil hadn't come to get an agreement by ceasing to be the devil, he'd come to take him in, Jesus adjourned the conference. He didn't go on talking indefinitely when the purpose was deception and not working out settlements. So, So President Eisenhower went to uh, Paris in 1955 at this summit and he made some gains. It, at least he didn't give away anything that didn't belong to us and that was a precedent. But, uh, uh, but his, main, his main purpose was to reassure the communists, to convince Mr. Khrushchev that he, he didn't have any reason to be afraid of us. We would never start a war. We would never fight unless we ourselves are attacked. He succeeded in convincing Mr. Khrushchev of that. That's all Mr. Khrushchev wanted to know, that we would not fight unless we ourselves are attacked. And Khrushchev went right back and within two weeks was shipping arms into the Middle East, Egypt and so on. The Middle East blew up right out of Geneva. Our president went there to get a settlement. The communists went there to win the next round. We went there to get an agreement. They went there to get victory. Mr. Nehru of India, he tried to call it off. He used to lecture us as materialistic militarists who didn't understand the Asians. He thought the Chinese communists were Asians. They were born in China, they speak Chinese, they are the Chinese race, they are not Chinese, they have rejected every value of Chinese culture, they are world revolutionists. Working for the well-being of the Chinese people, they're starving them tonight and have been for 10 years in order to export grain to carry on the world revolution against ourselves. And now Mr. Kennedy tried to call it off. It's been tried by all of them. He said that he thought there was a greater area, or his people did, a greater area of agreement than had possible and had been reached, and that by quiet diplomacy and greater civility, we wouldn't provoke the communists and then we could get agreement. So the new administration began by soft peddling the debates in the UN on communist action in Korea, Tibet, uh, 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 Hungary, and so on. And then they released a couple of red spies which had been caught in the act without, uh, without any trials in order to, without even filing charges, in order to reassure them that we were new approach, trying to turn over a new leaf and remove the ban on importation of crab meat produced under slave labor and remove the ban on importation of thousands of tons of communist propaganda every single month and went to the Geneva Treaty, uh, to this same book again, went to Geneva, the, the nuclear test ban conference on March 21st with seven 
drastic, imaginative, flexible concessions on testing, in return for which the communists, supposedly good sportsmen, were, were expected to make some reciprocal concessions on their part. They apparently looked at Mr. Dean and these seven concessions and must have been astonished. They promptly withdrew two concessions they had made last year. You see, it isn't possible to get agreement with. I don't care whether you're Democrats or Republicans. They're communists and they act like communists. You know, I watched those uh, New York Yankees. What would you have thought if Cincinnati had said, well, now they got a man on first base and they're tough. Let's just give them second base and then they'll feel so grateful they won't try to go to third base or home. <laughs> and this is the thing that's always being proposed here and there. Given Mr. Khrushchev does things he has no business to do, so we will make some concessions we have no right to make to get him to stop doing things he had no business to do. And after making those concessions, then he starts it up in some other country. It's all very simple. If I'm being too elementary, please forgive me. I work now in a place where we have to be elementary. Uh, I said... I said... I said you can't call it off. You can't call it off except on their terms, and their terms are surrender. Now, not necessarily surrender all at once. They know that would be too hard. They're willing to take it island by island. Why not begin with Kimoy? It is now ours. Uh, little country by little country. Why not Lebanon or uh, the Congo or Laos or city by city? How about West Berlin? You wouldn't want to go to war over two and a half million people. They're willing to take the surrender principle by principle, position by position. Oh, an Englishman said to me three, four years ago, during, three years ago during the Formosa crisis, he said, why not give them Formosa? It's just an island. I said, why not give them England? It's just an island. <laughs> there are two good reasons why we can't give it. One, it isn't ours. And two, it wouldn't solve the problem. The problem is not Timoy, the problem's Red China. You're going to solve the problem by making her stronger? The stake is not Timoy. Communist China doesn't want that bunch of rocks any more than we do. The stake was this. They were determined to show the people of Asia that the United States is an undependable ally, a paper tiger. And if they could show them that, then Asia has no choice except to make its terms. They're not after just West Berlin, although it's a thorn in their side. They're on the defensive there. It's a demonstration of their failure. I don't know why we would want to give it up. Here on one side is freedom, and on the other side is slavery, and the world can see. What? The, the issue is not West Berlin. The issue is Europe. The issue, the state is Europe. The issue is civilization. How are disputes to be solved? There have always been disputes, there always will be. Are they to be solved in civilized ways that man has been working to develop since he emerged from the jungle? Or are we to go back to the law of the tooth and the claw? This is what's involved in those areas, not a little island. But they confuse us by saying, you're going to go to war over that island? No, I'm trying to go to war over my own freedom. I got a couple of grandkids. I'd like to have them have some, something like the chance my forefathers worked to build and pass on to me. Now, you see, they're willing to take the surrender island by island, piece by piece, as I say, it's, it's, the old saying is the old salami slice, slicing technique. They bite off just a little bit. Well, that's not enough to go to war with about. And then they bite off a little bit more. And then they slice off a little bit more. None of them is adequate or justifiable for going to war. After a while, there's nothing left but the string. And certainly that's not worth going to war for. And they've got the war. Now, now this leads to another one. Since there is the enemy, and since we can't escape it, we have to fight the Cold War, and you can't call it off except under their terms, there's another one. You can't carry on the Cold War, continue it indefinitely as we have been, because, number one, we're not winning. And number two, it costs too much. If we don't spend more and more for arms, 
We invite insecurity and disaster. Let us fall behind and they say surrender or perish. If we do spend more and more for arms and for everything else that's been promised to, then we invite inflation and disaster. Either way, disaster. This is why Mr. Khrushchev smiles when he says we will bury you. He's convinced we're softened up. We aren't willing to pull our belts tight to put first things first. Some of these things I'd like, but we've been 180 years without him. We can go one more year while we meet this man on, uh, on the basis of his threat that he's going to bury us within the next few years. Now this leads to the last one. There is the conspiracy, can't escape it, can't call it off except under terms which are unacceptable. Can't continue, and as we have been, well, because it costs too much, there's only one left. We have to win the Cold War, which is what we never yet really have tried to do, partly because we didn't call it war. The communists have been winning this war because they know they're in it. We've not been winning it because it's the over streets named their new book. It's a war called peace. The power of a, an inaccurate label. Because it's called peace, we're not fighting it. Another reason why we haven't been winning it is because in our typical American self-assurance, we've just assumed that if by this or that concession we can avoid a shooting war, we'll always win any other kind of war. We'll always win the economic war. You're sure? How can American manufacturers and labor meet the competition of slave labor? How do you do business with people for whom a signature on a piece of paper has no validity, whether it's a contract or a check. How does a, it's like a baseball team play, trying to play with a football team on a tennis court. How do you do it? <laughs> football teams play by football rules, not tennis rules. That's why you have to study these books. They play by their rules, not our rules. Now, you have to go on from there. Other illustrations. We assumed that we'd always win the educational struggle. Not necessarily so. We could. And then we always assumed that we'd win the scientific struggle. We didn't work at it very hard and then went up Sputnik. Mr. Khrushchev made a mistake on that when he gloated so about their superiority because it wounded our pride and we went back to work. We can win it, any of them, when we go to work. Now we have another one. If we can just break the Iron Curtain or lift it a little bit so our people can go back and forth, then they'll get to know each other better and misunderstandings will be removed. And as Senator Dodd said, this assumes that they do what they do because of misunderstandings. No, they do what they do because they're communists and their objective is we're not better relations, it's world conquest. So uh, what happens? We haven't been too successful in this because we don't get an even exchange. Who goes over from our side? Anybody who wants to go and has got money enough to go. He hasn't studied communism. He can't meet the arguments of the professional. Most of us haven't studied our own system. We love it. We enjoy it. How many of us tonight could sit down and explain the essence of our system? Why it's good? What are the secrets that have given us this amazing production and wealth in our country? Why is it better? Why would they be better if they abandoned theirs and took ours? Can you do that? You can't find a communist that hasn't learned, even if it's only memorized, slick, slogan-like answers to these problems. So, who goes over from our side? Anybody that wants to go and's got money enough to get there. Who comes over from their side? Anybody wants to come? Oh, no, it'll be 10 million here the next morning. Nobody comes from their side unless he's been prepared, tested, screened. They're sure of him. So we send over Iowa farmers and they send over agents. And we send over journalists to observe journalists to observe facts and report them honestly. They send over agents looking like journalists to pass out and sell attractively their lies. We send over students, they send over agents. We send over professors, they send over agents. We send over businessmen, they send over agents. We send over congressmen, senators, governors, they send over agents. When have you known untrained amateurs to defeat trained professionals in any contest? We've got the best system the world has ever known based on what it's made possible for you and me and 180 million people and we haven't gone out and sold our own product. We don't under even understand it. I suspect I suspect the reason the communists lifted the curtain to allow this to go on is because they found the curtain was a historic mistake. 
Mr. Hitler demonstrated you don't need an iron curtain to maintain a dictatorship. Who were his best advertisers? Goring, Goebbels, not too many people believed them. It was American tourists, especially hard-headed practical businessmen. They wouldn't read Mein Kampf, it's dull, stupid reading. They didn't go over and look in the gas chambers where six million Jews were being exterminated. They said, we can judge by what we see. And what did they see? The streets were clean, the trains ran on time, the, there was no unemployment, there were no beggars, there was very little juvenile delinquency, the youth were all caught up in the great crusade, women had maternity benefits, everybody got a vacation at public expense in one of the rehabilitated spas, they had the highest living standards in Europe. What's wrong with a system that makes the people so much better off? We can do business with Hitler. You hear this thing now, but maybe the people in Cuba are better off, and maybe the people in China, Red China, are better off. You see, the fellow who says that has already accepted, without knowing it, the communist dogma that man is not the child of God born to be free. He's a steer, and if he's fat in the feed pen, it's all right, he's better off. We forget that communists or the tyrants don't do bad things in the beginning. They do good things to get into power and to keep, into po keep in power so they can then do their bad things. And now you've got people going over to the Soviet Union. They come back and they said, well, we were there and we saw and the people of the Soviet Union we found were very friendly and earnestly desire peace. Now, doesn't that prove that therefore we can get along with the Soviet government? No, it just proves that the people of the Soviet Union are very friendly and earnestly desire peace. All people are friendly. No people wants a war. But the catch is they don't have anything to say about their government. Thank God you and I can. If you say, what can I do? You can do everything. And if you lose it, you won't be able to do anything about whatever the things are that you're unhappy about or not fully satisfied about. Now, what do we do just in a word? First, wake up. We're the target. Study it. It's hard work. You don't want any surgeon to operate on you who hasn't spent a lot of hours with his pathology and surgery books. That's hard reading, too. How can you and I go out and say we're effective fighters for freedom or effective anti-communist workers if we haven't done our own homework? Study. Wake up. Second, negative. Don't build up the enemy. If the communists are not an enemy, why are we spending $46 billion a year to build up our arms against them? If they are an enemy, how can anybody justify training the enemy down in our bases in Texas or any of the other things? All right, I'll stop. This is why you can't admit China to the United Nations. There are no legal reasons, there are no moral reasons, and there are no practical reasons. It would be a smashing victory. Once we accept the bloody murders, does anybody, can anybody else resist them? Every communist movement and organization in the world has worked for recognition of communist China for 10 years. Do you suppose they're working for something that's going to be good for us and world peace and it'll be bad for them? If you can't get any guidance from your own government, read what the communists want and then you at least know what will be bad and what not to do because anything they want is not good for us. Now third, third, you've got to have power. You have to have power to hold. We've got power, economic power, military power, but it's got to be moral power. No more talk big and back down. We mustn't make pledges unless we keep them, whether they're in Laos or Cuba or West Berlin. About once more, back down and we won't have anybody left in the world that will trust it. But you can hold, just one second. You can hold with power. You can hold with power, but you don't win with power. You win with ideas, as the communists win with ideas. You win with ideas that tell the story that our forefathers, uh, of the things our forefathers understood when they built this country. We win with ideas that excite people's minds and ignite sparks in their souls and build stars in their eyes. And they go out with a song on their lips because they believe in something that's good and that's decent and that provides opportunity for man. Thrilling challenges. God said, to live in a time like this, to have a chance, not just to enjoy it, recapture under God a new understanding of freedom, and then go out and sell it. A friend of mine sent me this, the last little illustration, a book a couple years ago called They Signed for Us, 
It's a little book with a thumbnail sketch of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. I had forgotten that they didn't sign it on the 4th of July. They just voted to sign it and got out of town before they got picked up by the police as British, as traitors. They met secretly a month later and signed it, and their names weren't made public for six months so they'd have a chance to get back to their own homes. And some of them didn't get back. You remember, as C.D. Jackson said, they pledged, we, for the support of this declaration, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor, not just their spare change or what was left off or one meeting in Hollywood Bowl. No, no, the whole works they pledged. I'd forgotten how many gave their lives. I forgot how many gave their fortunes. The four who signed from New York were all very wealthy. Two had vast ocean fleets. They lost every vessel. They died in poverty. Not a man wavered. You see, the book is they signed for us. All I'm saying, my fellow Americans, is that the time has come when you and I have got to start signing for ourselves. Thank you.